All right, everybody, welcome to uh, the May 26th uh, Implementer Sync. Um, I guess we're, we'll go through some updates. Uh, Michael has to leave at the half hour, so uh, why don't you get us, get us started? Yeah, so um, as a lot of you know, we, we've been working on this implementation of um, IPFS for roughly like six months now. Um, and we're reaching a state where we're pretty happy with it. Um, it's probably gonna back the SLA for Web3 storage once we launch kind of payments into Web3 storage. Um, and uh, we're also kind of getting it ready as more of an open source project that people can actually kind of interact with a little bit. I think because it's code that's infrastructure, it's a little bit, you can't just like run it on your laptop. Um, and so it hasn't been super approachable. Um, so we're cleaning that up and getting some nicer kind of docs and branding around it and hopefully probably like early June, I expect us to do like a bigger um, blog post about Elastic IPFS. Um, and what it is kind of in short is um, a very large IPFS provider built on like in a cloud native architecture. Um, you basically, you just tell it about car files. You say, here's a car file URL and it uses Lambda to index that car file. It stores indexes of each block and where they are in the car file. Um, it provides those into um, a sort of elastic pool of bit swap nodes that run in Kubernetes and in multiple regions. So you might have bit swap nodes in several different regions that all look like one provider to the network. Um, all kind of, and that that sort of you know which which connection that you get, which node that you end up getting connected to is all managed by this sort of cloud infrastructure routing. Um, and uh, also, we're we're using the new store the index stuff for all the providing as well. Um, so that we're not kind of flooding the DHT anymore with, you know, 100 million CIDs uh, like we are currently with with uh, people's cluster. Um, so that's kind of the gist of of how it works um, and the scale that we currently operate it at, and we're kind of looking at it for. Um, and then I think it's just of interest to this group of people, um, even though there's there's nothing really to report on it. Um, Cloudflare had a bunch of releases over the last couple of weeks, and it looks like they have a slightly better way to potentially do a WebSocket service. And so we're starting to look at that as, because we only support WebSocket transport right now anyway, an Elastic Provider. Um, and now we're starting to look at like, okay, what is, what is missing in that interface um, for us to do a full lib P2P connection and potentially do some kind of a CDN and Cloudflare for BitSwap. Um, but that's very early. Like we're currently researching it and um, we expect that it'll be missing some features to do a full implementation, but we now have a good enough relationship with Cloudflare that we can probably get that stuff added in over the next like six months to a year into their platform. Um, but we're really interested in that. Um, the key to kind of improving our read performance across the stack has been um, our, our Cloudflare gateway um, CDN. We have like an 80 to 90% cache hit rate. Um, so that's just dramatically sped up like all of our reads for all of our customers. Um, and we'd love to do something similar for BitSwap. Um, also fairly attractive because uh, R2 storage has free egress. So all of our bandwidth bills would substantially <laughs> decline um, if we were to do a better job CDN in Cloudflare. So uh, yeah, that's kind of like a quick update on the stuff that we've been doing around kind of NFC storage and Web3 storage uh, for IPFS implementations. Cool. Very cool. Um, I guess I'll, I will I will briefly digress to something else because it seems related, uh, which is the reframe API um, for sort of uh, handling routing requests uh, is now in is being utilized by the Hydras and uh, is inside the is being used by the indexer at dev.cid.contact and is in the store the index repo, uh, which means that you can do things. Uh, I made a, a small implementation that does something like you send it a reframe request and it will then query the DHT and the indexers in parallel, combine the results and feed them back to you as it gets them, which means you can sort of delegate routing to this thing for provider records or IPNS things or whatever, and it will just like do it for you. Um, which is cool, because you could like, we have this in Go, but if someone wanted to help out on the JS front, you could hook this up. It would get, get you back results. 
anything that speaks web sockets, it would be able to just connect to. And then like you would have like functioning, I could pull pull data from, you know, pull data from BitSwap in a browser. And also I could do the IPNS things without needing to run like DHT stuff or like anything crazy, which would be both computationally impractical and also browsers don't have connections impractical. Um, that's awesome. We, we've been talking about delegated content routing for years. And I feel like at this point, it means so many things to different people that we probably can't even call what we ship delegated content routing. So I like that you have other words to describe it that are more specific. Yes, yeah, so we have a protocol it's called reframe. And then I have a, I have a small implementation called some guy uh, in that you ask some guy for directions and then they get you where you are going. Um, and that is what you are delegating to. Right, like you're not delegating to the indexers. The indexers are a system that you're querying. You're delegating to something like some guy to to do all that asking for you. Um, I'm I'm gonna fork that into an anonymous version called Rando. Rando, and, uh, also good. <laughs> I, I I wrote this last night, so uh, if you have better names or or other things, uh, please please feel free. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's that's very exciting. I look forward to a to a GitHub link to some guy. It's, it, drop it's, in, in the notes. it's in the notes. It's there already. Okay. No. Right. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, it's, not, it's all just smashed together. Some guy. We don't even cap case the G. This is a uh, total wild west. There, there is. I mean, I guess while while we're there, there is also a uh, a a new wild implement IPFS implementation appeared with an also great name uh, called YPFS uh, by Jeremy. Um, and you can check it out. Uh, it, you know, it got to start from scratch. Use some of the pieces that we already have in in GoLand, but do things like, you know, have a database and track your pins that way, and turn on all of the things that you want to serve lots of data from your machine that like a regular IPFS desktop user doesn't want to use. Ah, uh, he should have called it banana. Um, which I guess for those who are unaware, uh, GoIPFS is being renamed. Uh, Banana is the name we've been using in the intermediary as the, there will be some other name for Go IPFS. Uh, but if you have a better name, go to Go IPFS and leave an issue and leave a, a comment on the issue. If you have a troll name, you can do that too. People have done those. Uh, the first comment was a troll name, which is that we should rename to Golang-IPFS. to Golang -IPFS. That was the first suggestion uh, of the cycle. Um, Cool. And then I think, unless anyone's got anything else, next up is to talk about uh, some follow-ups from the uh, implementers workshop on Friday. Um, actually, I guess, uh, Brendan, you want to take it away or you want me to do it? Yeah. Happy to. <clears throat> so some of us, it, uh, maybe this has successfully pulled some people out back into the community, but we had an IPFS implementations workshop uh, last Friday. Smashing success, in my humble opinion, at one point, I think we had roughly 50 folks in the actual webinar. Uh, and then views on YouTube are just over a K already. And so we're like kind of doing well across the stream and a bunch of the videos. Thank you to everybody who slammed it. We plan this thing in a week. Um, so thank you to everybody who like slammed together a talk or even entertain the idea of slamming together a talk. It's deeply appreciated. In the future, there will be more lead time. In the future, Matt will tell you about these things in, in a more explicit way so that you can join them and enjoy them. Um, but the in that we sort of talked a lot about the need for implementations, the trajectory of of where we were going as a community, and sort of two broad level call to actions. One calls like this: let's let's get synced up on the sort of near term languages implementations and use cases, and then let's talk a lot about sort of broader broad, broader strokes, governance, sustainability, and interoperability across stuff, and so. Uh, in this conversation, I think what we were hoping to use some of this call to do was to gather um, as a group, I think we are missing a little bit of near term needs definition of like what do folks actually need from not just calls like this, but like as we start to coordinate as a community, what are your problems? So there's sort of like two things, servicing problems that we're having for folks who are writing implementations and like where, where are you seeing shortcomings in specs, where are you seeing shortcomings in like where you're trying to go and like where you might need to interrupt with other implementations, uh, shortcomings on use cases. Hey, we're trying to do X. We don't have throughput to do X. We can't hit scaling for Y, you know, whatever. 
uh, and then try to understand also at the same time, what do we need at the macro scale, right? Like what is what structures do we need to get in place to make sure that this that IPFS as a protocol is continuing to evolve and proliferate across all of the use cases where we think it's applicable. Um, and so that's really what we were hoping to do was use this conversation to just like start to gather a laundry list of stuff um, that would help us sort of understand how can we plan future gatherings? How can we do, if we hear five people asking for content writing intensives and store the indexes, the new hotness, and we all need to like really sort of congeal around that, great, let's talk about that. If we we're really, what we need is to understand how we're gonna plumb identity into IPFS better because this swap is now starting to take authentication tokens, then like, let's do that. Um, and so really this is a, uh, what we were hoping to do is leave the space here for others to just literally rhyme off, hey, here's what, here's what I need. <laughs> um, and, and take some time to make sure that that's captured and put into a content calendar so that we plan things to appropriately address those needs. Does that make sense? I can yeah. like, I can frame this or if ever someone has wants to just jump in, feel free. Otherwise I'm gonna pick on Lytle, so. Looks like Lytle's getting picked on. Gonna pick on Lytle in three, two, one. I feel, I feel big. <laughs> um, I know you're working on gateway stuff, Lytle, specifically specking out gateway stuff, I'm trying to understand more specifically what a gateway is. How's that going? What do you feel like you're missing there? Uh, more hours in the day. <laughs> I, th I, th I think uh, the, the bigger, it turns out there's a lot and I don't really like how organically it grew, but I think it's a good opportunity. Now, uh, first document existing state and as I'm documenting existing state, things that we could simplify, things that maybe we don't need to include like in the like core gateway spec. Uh, um, the ongoing uh, plan is to, I already split it into uh, like the path, basic path gateway, uh, something that I called trustless gateway, which is even more like smaller surface without any mut mutability, without any pathing resolution. It's just CAD and data going back in a, uh, as a block or a car uh, and a separate uh, set of gateways which built on top of those two are the web gateways and those are things like subdomain gateways uh, dns link gateway for a specific website um, those things that are designed to be uh, that, that makes sense only in the web browser like special handling of uh, 404s uh, redirects uh, those like uh, underscore redirects and underscore uh, headers those things will be um, kind of like the spec extension on top of the basic version that I'm creating I hope the next time we talk I will ask uh, for uh, feedback on a PR against public uh, IPFS specs repo um, I don't want it to kind of like take too long internally uh, just put the initial ver version uh, of current state it will be ugly but at least we will agree that it's ugly and how we fix it clean it up um redefine the smaller subset that other implementers can agree on because like right now it's impossible for a new implementation to implement everything that go ipfs does that's like <laughs> like I'm not able in one day to document that, even if I block entire day. So that's a little bit too much. But we we have a specific uh, sub, uh, like we have specific types of gateways that we can document. Uh, and yeah, like the RPC, like the GoIQFS specific RPC, it's not even in the spec <laughs> because it's not the gateway. Um, so I think we will be in a pretty good place. And I hope though that like the next, uh, next time we meet, uh, we not only will have uh, that basic <laughs> version, but we will have at least one, like multiple pull requests against that as a diff. Um, so I guess that's the status. Uh, I'll probably, I'll uh, send you on Discord on Slack or Matrix. Uh, so like before we join, uh, before we meet again, uh, we'll already have a uh, like review cycle, I think. Amazing. And Michael, while we still have you, I'd love to just like try and do some connected work here. 
Elastic providers dealing in car, car files specifically in and out, right? <clears throat> and so like, if I understand correctly, that's sort of extrajudicial to a gateway spec. Is that fair? Um, there's some stuff that we would like to have um, in the gateway spec related to how we're kind of storing data and how we're getting cars, um, especially moving forward. Um, so right now, so the way Elastic Browder works is you can give it um, a car file anywhere um, at any URL and it basically indexes it by URL. But we're working on a new um, upload API that basically uses, um, we have these UCANs that are like um, decentralized permissions, right? And you basically convert the UCAN into a signed S3 URL and then you can upload um, car files. When we do that upload, we actually key that um, S3 upload by the CID of the car file, so by the entire hash of the car file. And we're starting to get into this mode where, especially internally and in some of the bigger protocols, we work a lot with car CIDs and just move them around as a whole. Um, and so th starting to think about how we can leverage um, car CIDs, and specifically for some of the export um, points and stuff like that, um, and the gateway would be interesting. We haven't fully gone down like what that exercise would look like, but I know that like internally we'll be doing a lot of reads um, within the system via that. And it'd be nice to just be able to expose those via the gateway interface at some point in time. Um, we also just have like a huge number of new read interfaces that we're looking at building um, that some of them may not be a great fit to, to fit into a gateway spec. Um, but one thing that kind of keeps coming up is like, what is the extensibility model for the gateway? And given that like everything that we ever talk about here is some time kind of materialized view of an immutable state, um, how do we, like if we could find a way to do those transformations in WebAssembly, we actually would have a path to kind of content addressing the whole space and having some extensibility thing in the gateway. That's a little bit far off, but like that's definitely where we'd like to see things go because the way that all of our read interfaces work now is that we, we put every read interface into Cloudflare and we have a caching strategy around it. Um, and just being able to put that into the gateway would be great. Right now we have like a lot of custom APIs that we, we prefer to, to not have. Yeah. I think there's some, car, there's some car file stuff that I feel like, you know, a, a little bit like some of the, you know, there was only, go, you know, just do what Go IPFS is doing kind of things, which like aren't quite specced out. Like people's assumptions around what you do with car files what goes in a car file, right? Because because there's no, the car file spec just lets you put a collection of blocks in there. What kinds of blocks go in there? How big are they? Are there duplicates? If they have yeah. identity I mean, V1 or V2. Are they V1 uh, or V2? Are they, you know, mm -hmm. are they full graphs? Yeah. Are they not full graphs? What does any of well, this mean? Is like very, it's not covered by the spec, which means people have been making assumptions. In well, no, so, so yeah, I, I, yes, people have been making assumptions. That is definitely true. I feel like we, we've done enough education, like within our team to make sure that people don't make those assumptions. And it turns out that a lot of like this, the fact that you don't have these guarantees frees up some space to use car files in a lot of different ways that we're now kind of leveraging. Um, and at the same time, we're kind of going back to, to where, hey, you can't make these assumptions but there are certainly patterns that you can see in these car files. So how do we leverage those? So for instance, one thing that we're implementing right now is like when we get a want list, we do a bulk query for all the indexes for that want list. And when we, and then we group them by car file and then we sort them by the ranges. So when we have a continuous range, we don't do that many reads from S3. We do one continuous read from S3 and then break it up in memory. Um, it, similarly, if you get a, a request for a DAG P, for a couple DAG PB nodes and you, you look at the distance between them and it's the same distance between each of those, you can basically read that whole section, pull all of the, they're definitely gonna be uh, raw blocks that are in between and probably send them to the client via prefetch because the next request is probably gonna ask for those. So there's like, there's basically like, you know, with a 95 plus percent accuracy stuff that you can do just by pattern matching that you can do to like speed up bit swap and to speed up the performance of the system in general. And that's what we're kind of starting to look at in some of these car files. Um, the, but having a hash of the whole car file and using that as the identifier, that's just solved a bunch of problems for us because now we, you're not making an assumption that like the root CID means anything <laughs> reasonable about the car file, right? Like that was the big problem people were making. 
Um, and and we've also started to like, like I mentioned, you can something we're doing with you can is like you cans are um, basically signing chains of permission delegation. Um, it's like an amazing kind of construct. But um, when you're doing them with JWTs, which is what the, the spec uses by default, um, it gets kind of messy to be, have like multiple different blocks signed and then be signing the parents and like building a DAG out of it. So we have like a spec for doing them in IPLD. And when we do them in IPLD, we just encode them into a car file. And that binary of the car file is the token that we send around now. Um, and if we want to reference that token, we can use a car CID to reference the token, right? Um, and that's become very useful too, because now we can pass these through other protocols because they're, they're a decentralized mechanism for permissioning and, and delegation. Um, and if you look at like, like rather than doing kind of uh, centralized HTTP calls and RPC calls now, we basically have the RPC call in the UCAN chain as like the next block and all of the permissions that would give you the rights to do that in there. So what we're looking at kind of in the future is when you upload data into the service, the way that you have different users say mutate uh, an IPNS state or something like that, it would just be embedded into the car file. And when you write that, we'll pick it up. And when we look at the car file, we'll see that the new hands are in there. And then we'll do the RPC call to like update those, those IPNS records and do that rest of that work for you. So we really get to leverage like all of the capabilities of decentralized protocol being embedded into the data when you hand it into our system so that we can be a client of multiple decentralized protocols for you via one upload of a car file, right? Can I ask you a follow-on question, Michael? Sure. Um, yeah. How are you doing? Uh, are you guys have you considered, or or do you have any answer to the like attack vector nature of the asymmetric nature of car file responses? The fact that I can basically send you, hey, thirty-two byte CID, and I may be getting a very large payload response that is expensive on the server side. <laughs> well, um, if you hand me a car CID. Um, it's always in S3 as that car CID, and I can just hand that back to you. Um, if we were to move that into R2 in Cloudflare, that, that would actually be free for us. So it's not a huge right. deal. Right, but like, um, say that car but, uh, files like 50, 100 gigs. Like, is that, yeah, 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 yeah. do you have a cap well, yeah, yeah, on but, what you can upload? Um, so in the current architecture, yes, but that's going away when we go to direct S3 uploads. And that's one of the reasons why. Um, so like uh, in the current clients for both Web3 storage and NFT storage, um, we upload that through Cloudflare and there's a hundred megabit by um, up worker upload limit. So we look at the DAG and then we break the DAG into multiple slices of that particular DAG that are each as an individual car file. And then we upload them each as one part as an atomic transaction. And um, even once we get rid of the sort of limit on car file uploads, we expect people to do that for large uploads still because you want to be able to resume. And, you know, if you start uploading 30 gigs and you, you fail at 10, you, you restarting sucks, right? So. We, we think it's probably reasonable for people to be breaking things even into like maybe one gigabyte car files once we release the limit on it. Um, but I mean, like, we're probably going to implement a lower limit on NFT storage and have some limits there because it's all free. Um, but it, also, like, we've done a ton of work to like do chain indexing and um, and and think about like how we integrate some of the the future chain references to this data. Um, and we're now doing a lot of content detection. So we're working on like a CID insight system so that any data that we find out about, we can detect if it's porn and stuff like that. So we have a lot more sort of proactive uh, data introspection. So we're, we're getting much less worried about people kind of uploading whatever they want into NFT storage, um, even though it's basically free to the user because we have other mechanisms to know like, you know, this is actually isn't in an NFT. This actually is uh, just your porn that you're uploading. Um, <laughs> or actually not your porn you don't have a license to it um so <laughs> like technically um yeah yeah uh yeah so but but uh like in web3 storage you know you're actually paying for that upload anyway so we're much less worried about sort of like getting large data for each car file in that case uh, as you yeah. guys are building out um <clears throat> Kind of elastic provider, you know, you mentioned a lot of the content detection systems here. This is something that I, you know, we're kind of interested in as well. Is that is that ingestion stuff part planning to be part of elastic provider, or is that like a separate entity? Or um, 
it is connected to, but uh, separate from, and like we have a big microservices architecture. So this is like one, okay. this is another service, but basically all of the data that land that goes into Elastic Provider, the, that will get, go into CID Insights and we'll do detection on it. So when we get a car file, we'll look for any IPFS files. And then when we see IPFS files, we'll check, we'll try to figure out what media types they are. And then based on gotcha. the media type, we'll try to figure out some data around it. Um, but there's also like a query interface where you can ask about CIDs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those insights, we won't do for every data that ever comes in. It would just be too expensive. We're kind of waiting for yep. customers to ask for it. But the cool thing about it, being on an immutable state is that whatever response we get, like say we do facial recognition, we just cache that response forever. Um, and now it's like basically free to query it for that particular CID. Uh, and there, you know, sim we're looking at doing a similar thing for imagery sizing for uh, audio and video uh, transcoding, things like that. Are you guys, is that a repo that you guys have out there? <gasps> no, no, th this is the product that, that, we're, that we're working on right now. Um, so uh, okay. there's, Basically, to, to sort of like line up some of the dependencies here, um, Elastic Provider backs this new upload interface where we have to move both of our products to that new upload interface. When we move to the new upload interface, we lose some of the, the data processing that we're doing in flight to show us like what files are there. So CID Insights is initially getting built out just to, to show you like a view of the files that you've uploaded based on the cars that have come in by doing that secondary sure. processing. Um, and then, you know, eventually though, it'll turn into like a GraphQL interface that you can ask about. And we're also integrating the, the nifty save data into this too. So you can do things like have a GraphQL interface, have a GraphQL query where you say, for these CIDs, tell me about their images and then give me a resize of all of their images in one call, right? Things like that. For sure. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I, the, the detection stuff is, is just primarily interesting to us because I'm sure it's no surprise to you guys. Mm -hmm. Phishing content <laughs> is uh, abound. So um, if, if, if there is any room for collaboration there, I think we'd be mm -hmm. um, you know, interested in working with you guys on that. Yeah, yeah. There, there's two things that we're looking at early. One is like, it'll be an API that you can query if you want to ask us about CIDs. Um, and then two, oh, sure. like when we when we hit this detection, we want to have some kind of a feed and, and pub sub system for telling everybody about it, uh, particularly for like the um, any data that we that we find out is malware and stuff like that. We really want to like be more proactive about that. So that let, we, we don't like we've been getting blocked by Google and, and dealing with that whole thing on our gateway. And we'd really like to like uh, help all the other gateways that are going to get blocked when, when they get the same thing. Um, so hopefully we can, we can provide that into the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm getting at. I think it'll be a, yeah. kind of a mutual effort between a lot of the parties. Um, yep. Yeah, totally. Fantastic. Do you mind if I totally switch gears? Yeah. You go. Now. <clears throat> We have YPFS originator on the call, and, and we were originally talking about it at the top of the call. And this in this block, we're also asking about <clears throat> pain points for implementations. Why, if I can read chat correctly, uh, you had sort of been talking about the store the index um, interface and being able to sew it into or out of the provider interface. Um, do you think you could talk briefly about YPFS, why you made it, and then maybe answer a little bit about what's going on there? I mean, I mostly made it because I wanted to be able to have something that worked like estuary, but wasn't attached to estuary. So a nice pinning through a Postgres database and a scalable block store by default and um, all the bit swap tweaks I've made. So it makes it go a little faster. But I think um, Matt also was wondering about the pinning stuff for a while and I promised him extracting that stuff into Go IPFS, but that whole adventure seems um, fraught. So it's a little easier just to put it in a new package and um, simplify things down a bit. Yeah, um, I guess I can kind of elaborate on that. I mean, I guess kind of on our end right now, right? I, I uh, the PL team has kind of seen me asking a lot of questions around things like garbage collection and and whatnot. Um, and well, I guess Mikhail just dropped off there, but um, what I'm really trying to kind of find out is, you know, with all the implementations that are now arising, right? You know, anyone we move to is probably gonna be taking a little bit of a technical effort jump. So I'm just kind of trying to, I read the tea leaves, if you will, to figure out kind of, you know, which way we need to be hitching our horse and figure out, okay, 
because we're, we're starting to get to the point where we really want to start contributing and adding to these types of projects. Um, we kind of finally have a team that's able to start doing that. Um, but, you know, is it, you know, why, why PFS? Is it, uh, you know, elastic IPFS? Is it uh, banana, you know, <laughs> whatever, uh, whatever it kind of is. We're just kind of curious there. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to work with you for what you need um, added to it if you want to use YPFS, but no big, big deal either way. I think the um, the thing I'm excited about is just how just throwing everything in a Postgres database makes a lot of things so much simpler. And it's also, you know, very easy to run and flexible with whatever. I'm also trying to make it so I, you can just like point it at an existing IPFS repo and have it take over from there. So you don't have to deal with any like new, any migration or anything. It just like sucks up the repo and calls it good. Um, so are you looking, are you looking at this then as like not elastic provider, but like a, you know, a... no, I'm not trying to like, you know, give Jeff Bezos more money. Um, just trying to, make something that can you know go a little faster yeah. and deal with your pins for sure yeah, yeah. i can i can I respect that desire i think there are pieces here where like you know a few of like the the big areas of like improvement across different implementations some of them are there's some that are like protocol changes and improvements there are some that are like call them like maybe somewhere in between like algorithmic changes, right? Things that are like not quite protocol level, but like in the, how do I think about dealing with this level? Some are like really implementation tied things. Like how am I actually storing my bytes on disk and grouping them? And when do I want to get rid of them? Do I, do I want garbage collection or do I just want to like delete the things as soon as I hit the delete button and like there is no garbage collection, right? Um, right, like those sorts of things, which like become harder to plumb into like, you know, different implementations have different pulls here. Um, but the area is like, we share a lot of the libraries, like the, like the YPFS thing is not like all of the libraries have been recondensed into like, you know, 2K lines of code or something. It's like, you just ripped out all the pieces you needed and then we're like, yep. Yeah, see that pinning interface? How about no? And instead this, right? Block stores, okay, th those seem okay. FlatFS, that, that seems all right if we tweak it like this. Right, um, and then changes that we'll want to make to to bit swap. Right. Well, similarly, we can like propagate these things upstream because even the, the tweaks that Jeremy has there are good, but like the tweaks are also like they they shouldn't be needed that way. They should be slightly different because like it's just like oh yeah, I want to send more data because I'm a big server, which is like that's good, but maybe you should also like prioritize who you're sending your data to and like have back pressure yep. the right way and like stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think having more of these places where we can like congregate around the shared pieces we need, because like the, the actual binary thing that lives at the end feels like, I feel like that's where like a lot of like the, the like, well, it doesn't quite work for my use case exactly like this. And it feels a little awkward to put this thing in here. Conversations come up. But if all the shared pieces are the same and it, you don't have to rethink like, how do I ingest the UNIXFS directory and put it into a block store or into a car file or into a whatever? Like if you don't have to worry about those things so much, then like it makes it much easier to build what it is you actually need. That is not a question I'm answering with this. There is no, um, there's no facility for like doing fancy, you know, adding a whole directory. You can throw a single file at it and do the Unix vest chunking, which I, I don't even know if that belongs there, but the main idea is it is a pinning backend and has can probably take car files in. Gotcha. Yep. <clears throat> if, if I can jump in, I, I think Matt, you know, you're framing your question like, hey, how do I even like compare and contrast what's going on in the ecosystem? Um, I post a link to the classic HTTP benchmarks. Um, I think that there's, we have a couple of things, two things happening at once, right? Like as why, as you just mentioned, like we have use case specific, like 
I'm, I'm completely deviating from. I don't really care. I have a use case I'm trying to meet. But then we also have um, this this concern about like just like measurements. Like one of the things that jumped out immediately when I saw YPFS pop up on my um, feed was like, oh shit, I'd love to measure that. And then the next question that follows is like, well, what are the standard measurements? Like, um, how do we actually compare implementations? And what would those like what would those metrics be? Even if the comparison is unfair, given a certain use case, but like, you know, we've we've seen a lot of stuff battered around. Um, but I think it'd be really nice as a community to start to hammer out like, hey, if you had to take anything that claimed to be IPFS and you had to measure it, um, can we understand like what metrics would be useful for just doing a, a ten thousand foot thing? And then we can get into the whole feature comparison, languages, you know, use cases in a, in a separate conversation. But just like I, one thing I'd really like to see emerge in the next short future is like, hey, can we agree on like time to first byte, throughput, you know, like what what, do we, what would we actually use to measure an implementation? Um, that I think would be a really useful step forward. And Matt, remind me if I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, and just like understanding and assessing like kind of objectively what all these different implementations do. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of those things are, you know, they're always important. Um, in addition, I'm also kind of, um, you know, just curious, you know, where is the development heading here, right? Like where are the resources being poured? Um, if, you know, Elastic provider, for example, like, hey, we're a big cloud provider, right? We serve a lot of content at scale and cloud native, like all that kind of stuff, right? Like, um, I, th I think kind of what I've gathered from uh, various, you know, public communications has been, uh, you know, not every IPFS implementation should be used for every specific thing. And I actually, you know, wholly support that, right? So I don't think it's fair to me to say to a dean, like, hey, you know, I need, I need Go IPFS to scale horizontally automatically to a million people, right? That's, you know, maybe not where Go IPFS wants to be, or I guess, sorry, Banana wants to be. Um, <laughs> but um, I guess just kind of, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what, what are the features and what are the directions that each of the clients are, are heading towards? Not necessarily just from like a speed and performance side of things, but also from like a, um, you know, we talked about, okay, you know, car file ingestion, how does the content get there? Can it do things like garbage collection? Um, can it, uh, you know, security benefits, like stuff like that. This is kind of all the various things I'm trying to, to balance and think through. So um, you want to, yeah. you want a spreadsheet roadmap, roadmap <laughs> aggregation. I mean, I love it, but I understand we're kind of doing backroom deals right now on the IPFS <laughs> implementers call. So or not. Accurate you know deals I mean. on a public recorded call. It's very exactly. Very yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel like a, we're in a secret club right now, but yeah. So um, just kind of trying to understand things is really, really what I'm looking for right now. Yeah. And um, I think you're not the only one, right? Like Moe's on this call writing a browser that has to deal with like 14 different peer to peer networks that I still don't understand how anybody can get that to work properly. And like, you know, they would ideally be able to compare and contrast some of these tech as well, like I don't think you're the only person with these questions, um, and just like being able to quickly understand intended use cases of given different implementations, I think it sounds like you're prioritizing that above like a hey, let's figure out a uniform way to measure these things in yeah. terms of like a lab. Yep, and then also uh, in terms of like kind of community collaboration here as well, um, you know, which which tools are going to be more apt for us to make PRs against, you know, open to that kind of stuff. Um, if, if we, if we do want to put something forward that we think would benefit everybody, like, um, you know, how, how hard is it to get that kind of stuff in? Um, also kind of curious on, I don't expect yeah. all the answers well, to be flushed out here. This is my, Hey, Hey guys, like good to see y'all again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Adine, sorry. Go ahead. I saw, I suspect part of this, right. Is like, if you, the, most of the time when someone starts an implementation, um, it's to try and solve a particular case uh, if it's going to be useful at all, um, right? Ba bad implementations, my two cents are like, have you considered rewriting Go IPFS in like Python? Like that, that sounds like a bad implementation, right? Um, 
having nothing to do with anything about Go IPFS, just like, why would I rewrite the same thing and do it again in Python uh, without having like a, a reason to do so? Um, people disagree. Some people are like, it should be everything, it should be in every language, which is fine. I just think like when you build something, probably you want it to solve like a job the other thing isn't doing for you. Um, that's just my bad. But the, so some of the implementations that are rolling out are like targeted at use cases that look a lot like I want to pin lots of data and then serve it to lots of people. And so if you start looking at those ones and the groups and the people that are there, uh, it's probably like a good place to start because at the very least you then get to push at them and say like, your model is different than mine. Like for instance, you, you talk about like garbage collection. You are, you are caching data even after nobody else is paying for it anymore because like you think it might come back. I think this is a bad idea. I'd rather use some of your tools and put them together differently because like I don't think that's right, you know? Um, and flesh out because maybe of the various people doing, doing pinning things like they're learning, some of them are learning this way and some of them are not. An interesting thing, I guess, is like to some extent both uh, Boost and Elastic Provider sort of ended up at the same place of like, how do I build a big database with all my IPLD stuff? Have you considered car files with a big index? Uh, and they sort of ended up there like kind of independently, which seems to indicate like, oh, this maybe is like an interesting way to build this, or at least isn't too hard to get started with. Um, and, and pieces you can work in, in that direction. I think another piece we may need here that's not just like the, uh, aside from the performance stuff is also some like compliance things. Um, and they sort of, they can live a little next to each other. So one thing I think would be really cool um, is there someone right now working on like a pinning service compliance, like a pinning API compliance test. That's like, are you doing these things? Uh, which will both do things like point out the bugs that you know Jeremy and others have found in like the client implementation and also find the bugs that the clients have found in the like server implementation. But also- once These are like live conformance tests? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like point me at an endpoint and be like, do you do, you do it? Um, and what also seems cool is like, once you have the sort of compliance stuff there, you might also be able to build like tooling to help both service providers and users like figure out what's going on. It's like, I pin my data with, you know, I pin my data with Estuary and like, how long did it take for me to start being able to like retrieve the data or upload the data and then retrieve the data? And when I came back to look for it, was I able to find it? Um, how did that work, right? And like, you can make some of these things sort of usable across services so that you don't have to, Almost, it's like both a user infor user informative tool and a debugging tool, because it helps the users figure out where it's working, where it's not, and helps the service providers be like, "Oh, wait a second, that shouldn't work that way. I thought it didn't work that way, right?" And then they can like they can like poke around with that. Um, I feel like we're we're getting closer because once we have compliance tests, then we start getting there. But that feels like it's like start with the compliance, then you move to performance because then you're measuring yeah. the performance around a compliant surface. Is, is someone working on that right now? Yeah, so someone's working on compliance. Uh, Let all post it in the, in the chat. We've already found a few, a few bugs in some, some providers um, and, and uh, Russell's been reporting them as he goes. Uh, so it's like all, already, starting to, already starting to pay off in that way. But, uh, totally. Yeah. yeah. The only reason I ask is like, I'm a little concerned about sustainability, right? Like it's, it's really hard for folks on this call to like carve out the time to write something like that and just like try and understand how we situate that. Cause there's clearly, um, usefulness across the board, but how do we make sure that that stuff's actually continuing to happen? Um, it's a big question, right. but and I, I feel we has had some of this that's been a little bit easier cause they've worked with like you can use car files as fixtures to do sorts of some of like some of the kinds of tests that you might want to show compliance in that way. They're at like the, we'll call them like some of the network layers, compliances can be more complicated. Um, 
you know, like we have this complicated interop thing that tests some of our JS and Go stuff, but like it's it, it does it like in a totally the wrong way because it does it based on the surface of the HTTP API instead of like I speak bit swap, you speak bit swap, right? Um, but this is a uh, I think that's like an area we well, we're going to have to start doing as we start building across more implementations and, and particularly across language barriers where like you lose a bunch yeah. of the test suits. So we're going to have to do this anyway. Yeah, and keeping the boundary of the wire is the only same way to do this, right? Like, yeah. It's just, yeah. I think like yeah. folks like like Martin have done this with like like quick. There's like a humongous test suite that like all the everybody who builds a quick thing uses to make mm -hmm. sure that they are in fact doing the right thing. Um, it takes work, but I mean, I, discovering the subtle bugs <laughs> may may add up to more time uh, than than having it in the first place. Yeah, totally. I think there's another like to an adjacent concern. I do I do want to like come back, circle back to this from the store of the index provider in, interface implementation. We're thinking inside of the column of a language. There's kind of like I want to know how much need there is because like Matt you're talking about hey we finally have a team who's ready to contribute some stuff and like when we actually get the modularity of things right you know can we contribute CID auditing as like a thing that would fit into a nice place in the stack and can we ideally make that pluggable in multiple you know make that reusable across a number of different things I want to know how much interest there is in like doing the work of making some of those APIs uniform because I know it's super hard the distinction between like a DHT and an index sort of interface have different sort of like things they're trying to play to. And then do we, should we as a community be trying to make those Lego blocks the same shape or is that not worth their time? I, I highly suspect this is like a language dependent kind of thing because, you know, I guess some examples, right? A language like Java, you like define the interface and then like you people have to use the interface. Uh, and that's what you're building around. A language like Go, you have like, you can define the interfaces at the call site instead of at the declaration. And so like the model changes there a little. And then, you know, you have like ancient, you have like older Go code that has no concept of generics. And so they've built around crazy big interfaces like the content routing interface when like nothing, very few things implement the content routing interface in its entirety. There's only one thing that does and a lot of things that do parts. And so you have to wrap them all with like, nope, don't do that. Nope, don't do that, uh, right? And like, I think, so I think it, it's language specific. I think within Go, we can start to do this. I think what happens is you start to extract packages and figure this out, um, but also extract and then group them, right? So I think Carson uh, and some folks at Textile this week ran into, they were like, oh, hey, how do I ingest a whole bunch of files and like do UnixFS things with them. I found all the UnixFS code and I can use the HTTP, the you know, HTTP API that takes it, but like, how do I work with this? It's like, well, it's in the Go IPFS files package, which is the name of the node. And you could have looked there and poked around, but also like, there's a lot of packages. Is that, is that like a reasonable thing that they're gonna find unless we, we put some effort into like helping things be more discoverable? You know, probably not. I think I think putting effort into discoverability and 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 helping people get what they need that's not restricted to a, a matrix of like help and then, <laughs> and then people respond uh, would be yeah. would be good. I think I think that's something um, that's kind of important to us as well. Like, while we would love handholding, we recognize that's not great for the people who are trying to advance these things. Um, so it's kind of, you know, help us help you. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. it's easy, easier for us to learn the things so that we don't need to ask you the things. I totally think, and I think, you know, I, I'm i going out on a limb here, but like these conversations, because they are language specific, feel like the better forum for them is online. And maybe we can use forms like this to say, hey, we just need to get like a lay of the land. Can <laughs> we get a little bit better of an organizational structure to the actual entry point into what plugs into where um, and make sure that those matter, particularly as like 
others from your team are running into that. I think those are really useful problems. Like as somebody who beat their head against every GitHub issue and closed pull request on GoIPFS in the early days to try and like figure out what went where, that was a really expensive learning curve. And things we can do to flatten that curve, I think are really important. Um, but they but they are really bounded to languages. Like it's not, I don't think it's as, like when we're talking about conformance tests and wire you know, implementation stuff like that feels like it's, it's generally applicable. Um, I just wanna make sure we find the right forum for, hey, how do we improve the learning curve on a specific uh, language and platform set of combinations? Yeah, I think understanding also like, there's some talk, you know, last, I guess, at Lab Week around like, how do we do some level of like repo consolidation and on the library side, libpip has been doing a lot of this, which helps on that front. IPFS still has many, um, both because the IPFS org was like the, the originating org of all the repos. So we have all the strays, but also because we took all the pieces that were in Go IPFS. We they got moved out to make sure they were separable, and they are. But now they're separable, but like they're all the way over there and hard to find. And so like finding the balance where we get to bring them back and having folks like engaging engaging in the plan for how we how we do that or how we want to do discoverability, whether it's across many repos or or centralizing the repos. Um, I think would be be useful and we can do some of those like in github issues or or in in discord just to like get like a rough understanding of where we're going because yeah the idea is to like make the make the things easier for people at no point should anyone have to like follow the go ipfs like fx dependency injection graph to figure out how anything happens because like you'll never get out of there um yeah all right, so, so finding how we wanna like put these pieces in. Totally, we have four minutes left in the call. Does anybody have anything that didn't get covered that they feel like really should have any burning questions? I guess I had a brief, a brief pitch, I guess, which is that uh, I, this came I think from Dietrich's suggestion uh, at, on Friday, just like, hey, there don't seem to be many impl IPFS implementations that are like, call them like transient in nature. Like you just sort of, you get them, you do the thing, and then you stop doing the thing. Um, which but Barge is. So, so, Barge does, so Barge does some of this, although Barge is stateful, right? Um, and so maybe what you want is like something that looks like somewhere between Barge and like, yeah, like something like Barge that makes it so like, oh, I don't have to use like, you know, a like pending service specific API to do this or have to worry about like using like IP get. I can just be like, I want to push the thing and I want to pull the thing. And if I want something where I actually have to like track updates and stuff, then like Barge or like, you know, Jeropo's like Linux to IPFS thing seem much better. But if I just want to like run a thing in CI, because I see some people run these things in CI, um, and GitHub is very unhappy about when you try and make more than a couple of connections in CI, uh, you could like hand them these tools and they wouldn't have to have to worry about it. Um, yeah, so maybe it's that's PRs to barge, but uh, I think yeah, having some tools that that are are uh, set up for people who want to move around IPFS things in CI. I uh, think we have the tools to do it. We just gotta do some plugins. Fantastic. Anybody else? Bueller? Bueller? No? If, cool. if folks if folks have any other thoughts on there was some some async filling out of some things on the IPFS implementer summit brainstorming uh yeah if you have thoughts on some of the things that are already there uh make some comments and uh people can respond uh async yeah same bad time same bad channel in two weeks see you all then and oh yes <clears throat> we're going to take some of this stuff gathered in this call i'm going to condense this this, these notes down and add them to that implementer summit. So like 
a lot of the stuff we talked about, Matt, um, that'll get added de facto. Uh, and I'll ping in the implementers channel on Discord when it is done. Sound good? Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody, good for your you. time. Great hanging out with you. Bye-bye.